In Philip K. Dick's To Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, Mercer and Mercerism play a completely central role in the culture of human beings on Earth at that time. And it's also one way to differentiate human beings apart from androids, because androids can't take part in the fusion, but human beings, including specials like Isidore, are able to do so and find incredible you know, solace and meaning in this as well, uh, partaking in it through empathy boxes. So when Buster Friendly places Mercerism in his sights, it's going to provoke some very important reactions and realizations. And we find that, um, you know, Buster Friendly is somebody who not only does everybody listen to quite often, or at least many people do, but Isidore particularly likes him, John Isidore, the special. But he says something about Buster Friendly irritated him. One specific thing. In subtle, almost inconspicuous ways, Buster ridiculed the empathy boxes associated with mercerism, not once, but many times. He was, in fact, doing it right now. No rock nicks on me, Buster prattled away to Amanda Werner. And if I'm going up the side of a mountain, I want a couple of bottles of Budweiser beer along. The studio audience laughed and Isidore heard a sprinkling of hand claps. And I'll reveal my carefully documented expose from up there. That expose coming exactly 10 hours from now. And then a little bit later on, uh, Isidore says, maybe Buster is jealous. That would explain it. He and Wilbur Mercer are in competition. But, but for what? Our minds, Isidore decided. They're fighting for control of our psychic selves. The empathy box on one hand and Buster's guffaws and off-the-cuff jibes on the others. I'll have to tell Hannibal Stoat, that's his boss, that. Ask him if it's true. He'll know. Now, who is Buster Friendly? We'll find out later. Pris, the android, says that he's one of us. Right? And this could be true, or it you know, could be false. Um, we're not really quite, quite sure, right? Um, Pris is talking about, you know, the empathy boxes and stuff like that. And um, then Irmgard Irm breaks in. So Pris says, I don't think this will end the cult of Mercer. This is after the expose. But right this minute, there's a lot of unhappy human beings. To Isidore, we've waited for months. We all knew it was coming, this pitch of busters. She hesitated and then said, well, why not? Buster's one of us. An android, Irmgard explained, and no one knows, no humans, I mean. Now, is this really the case? I mean, people are suspecting something, even somebody who's mentally uh, regressed like Isidore is able to think things through, right? So there's this, this very uh, interesting... Uh, Part here, here we go. Um, Buster Friendly's odd show, like the TV version, continued 23 unbroken warm hours a day, the additional one hour being a religious sign-off, 10 minutes of silence, then a religious sign-on again. And he says to himself, here we go, um, women like Amanda Verner never made movies, never appeared in plays. They lived out their queer, beautiful lives. As guests on Buster's unending show appearing, Isidore had once calculated as much as 70 hours a week. How did Buster Friendly find time to tape both his odd and vid, vid shows, Isidore wondered. How did Amanda Verner find time to be a guest every day, month after month, year after year? How did they keep talking? They never repeated themselves, not so far as he could determine. The remarks always witty, always new, weren't rehearsed. Amanda's hair glowed, her eyes glinted, her teeth shone. She never ran down, never became tired, never found herself at a loss as to a clever retort to Buster's bang, bang strip of quips, jokes, and sharp observations. So how is this going on? It's clearly beyond um, normal human capacities, right? And so... The boss, Sloat, actually has some ideas about this as well. 
Uh, Isidore says to him, I think Buster Friendly and Mercerism are fighting for control of our psychic souls. If so, Sloat said, Buster is winning. He's winning now, Isidore said, but ultimately he'll lose. Sloat raised his head. Why? Because Wilbur Mercer is always renewed. He's eternal at the top of the hill. He's struck down. He sinks into the tomb world, but he rises inevitably and us with him. So we're eternal too. He felt good speaking so well. Usually around Mr. Stoat, he stammered. Sloat said, Buster is immortal like Mercer. There's no difference. And Isidore says, how can he be? How can that be? He's a man. Sloat says, I don't know, but it's true. They never admitted it, of course. And then he says, is that how Buster Friendly can do 46 hours of show a day? That's right, Sloat said. What about Amanda Werner and those other women? They're immortal too. Are they a superior life form from another system? And Sloat says, I've never been able to determine that for sure, as I have conclusively in the case of Wilbur Mercer. Um, and then he goes on to, to deal with the, the cat that they've brought in, and it breaks off. So we've got a couple possibilities. Who is Buster Friendly? Is he an android, as Pris and Irmgard are going to say a little bit later on? Is he some sort of human, but doing something beyond total human capacities? Or is he some sort of alien life form from another place which is immortal? All of this is going to be, in some respects, besides the point. As we find out when the expose begins, um, it's it's, uh, talked about at the very end of chapter 17 where... um, Rachel wants the radio on to hear it, but then we actually hear it narrated at the same time as the androids are dismembering the spider uh, in Isidore's apartment. And so uh, here we go. In the living room, Buster Friendly on the TV screen said, take a look at this enlargement of a section of background. This is the sky you usually see. I'll have Earl Parameter, head of my research staff, explain in their virtually world-shaking discovery to you. And so what, what is it going to be? Well, uh, they begin with the set. So what's going on there? Blow-ups of the video pictures, a new voice from the TV said, when subjected to rigorous laboratory scrutiny, reveal that the gray backdrop of sky and daytime moon against which Mercer moves is not only not Terran, it is artificial. Very important distinction there. Artificial how? Well, the TV set continued. The moon is painted in the enlargements, one of which you see now on your screen, brush strokes show. There's even some evidence that the scraggly weeds and dismal sterile soil, perhaps even the stones hurled at Mercer by unseen alleged parties, are equally faked. It is quite possible the stones are made of soft plastic, causing no authentic wounds. In other words, Buster Friendly broke in. Wilbur Mercer is not suffering at all. So the set, the plot, what it, what it is, the scene is fake. And then the research chief says, we managed to track down a former Hollywood special effects man, a Mr. Wade Cortot, who flatly states from his years of experience that the figure of Mercer could very well be some bit player marching across the soundstage. Cortot has gone so far as to declare he recognizes the stage as one used by a now out of business minor movie maker with whom Cortot had various dealings several decades ago. So according to Cortot, Buster Friendly said, there can virtually be no doubt. Now notice at this point the kind of case they're they're making. Well, we got a guy who says that this looks like a movie set that he was on a couple decades ago, and you know, that's painted. So the Mercer thing is is fake too, right? Now this is actually a, a, a weak argument up to this point. And you know, Buster Friendly, there is possible doubt at this point. But the research uh, chief says, we spent a good deal of time examining publicity pictures of bit players once employed by the now defunct Hollywood movie industry. We located by means of thousands and thousands of photographs a very old man now named Al Jerry, who played a a number of bit parts in pre-war films. From our lab, we sent a team to Jerry's home in East Harmony, Indiana, 
I'll let one of the members of that team describe what he sound. And then a new voice comes in. The house on Lark Avenue in East Harmony is tottering and shabbing at the edge of town where no one except El Jerry still lives. Invited amiably in and seated at the stale-smelling, moldering, kipple-filled living room, I scan by telepathic means the blurred, de- debris-cluttered, and hazy mind of Al Jerry seated across from me. I found the old man did in actuality make a series of short 15-minute video forms films for an employer who he never met. And as we'd theorized, the rocks did consist of rubber-like plastic, the blood shed was ketchup, and the only suffering Mr. Jerry underwent was having to go an entire day without a shot of whiskey. So now it's moved from, well, could be kind of maybe plausible to we've got the smoking gun. We've got the actor. Al Jerry, who admits that he did these uh, vignettes for somebody. We're not quite sure who. And, um, you know, there was no actual pain or suffering. And then um, Buster Friendly clinches it. He says, Al Jerry. Well, well, an old man who even in his prime never amounted to anything which either he or ourselves could respect. Al Jerry made a repetitious and dull film, a series of them, in fact, for whom he knew not and does not to, to this day. It has often been said by adherents of the experience of Mercerism that William Merce, Wilbur Mercer is not a human being, that he is, in fact, an archetypal superior entity, perhaps from another star. Well, in a sense, this contention has been proven correct. Wilbur Mercer is not human, does not, in fact, exist. The world in which he climbs is a cheap Hollywood commonplace soundstage which vanished into Kipple years ago and who has spawned this hoax on the Saul system. Think about that for a minute folks. So he's laid out what's what's going on. You know, it's it's a sound it's a set, uh, there's a scene, there's an actor, it's all fake. None of it was real. There is no such thing as Mercer. Mercer is not suffering in any of this. And so this raises the question. What is going on with these human beings that are gripping these empathy box things and seeing the Mercer vignettes and being there with all these other people, sharing not only memories and perceptions and physical violence done to their bodies, but also their moods, their emotions, all this stuff. What's going on in this fusion that androids themselves can't partake in. And so Buster Friendly comes to his conclusion, Mercerism is not just false, Mercerism is a swindle. He says, we, can, we can't uh, fathom the peculiar purpose behind this swindle. Yes, folks, swindle, Mercerism is a swindle. And he says, what is it that Mercerism does? Well, if we're to believe its practitioners, the experience fuses men and women throughout the Saul system into a single single entity. Now, is it a single entity or, or not? If we look at the other parts, we see that maybe that's not the case. But what we do uh, see is that they are all together in one consciousness together, one one you know empathizing, whatever we want to call it, set of relations. And so, friendly says. Maybe somebody could use this for nefarious purposes. He says, uh, an ambitious, politically minded, would-be Hitler could, and so he's suggesting that. But interestingly, the androids there in uh, Isidore's apartment draw a different conclusion. This is actually something to help separate out human beings who can participate in this, or at least think they can. Maybe it's all fake, right? From the androids who can't really make sense of it empathetically, though they can understand cognitively how important it is for human beings. Maybe this is a way of being discriminatory towards androids, to maintaining a false division between the human being and the android. She says, without the Mercer experience, we just have your word that this empathy business, this shared group thing, And then she says, how's the spider? So it's interesting because she's showing 
her very lack of empathy at the very same time that she's saying, yeah, maybe this empathy thing is overrated and, and Mercer at the heart of it is all a fraud. Now, does the revelation that Mercerism is a swindle and Mercer himself is going to say, yes, it, it, it's false. It, it, you know, all these, these things that Buster Friendly are pointing out is true. Does that change anything? And the answer, strangely enough, is no. And so we have two really interesting encounters with Mercer after this revelation. First, Isidore, his apartment is breaking down into Kipple, and uh, he says, um, you know, Mercerism isn't finished. Something ailed the three androids, something terrible. The spider, he thought, maybe it had been the last spider on Earth. And the spider is gone, Mercer is gone, and the, you know, everything starts breaking down. He grabs the empathy box, uh, you know, but he's also descending into the tomb world. So we see uh, Irmgard Beatty says, he's breaking everything, what's he doing? And he says, I'm not doing it. And everything within the apartment starts breaking down. Um, he says, it's happening to me again. I'll be down here a long time. It's always long. A dry wind rustled around him. The heaps of bones broke. Even the wind destroys them at this stage, just before time ceases. I wish I could remember how to climb up from here. He says, Mercer, where are you now? This is the tomb world, and I'm in it again, but this time you're not here too. He's been abandoned. And then uh, he says, um, here we go. Something crept across his foot. The mutilated spider advancing itself haltingly on its surviving legs. The spider who he drowned in order to put it out of its misery. He picked it up and held it in the palm of his hands. The bones have reversed themselves. The spider is again alive. Mercer must be near. And so he says, uh, come here to Mercer. Uh, and he cries, Mercer. And then Mercer shows up and he says, is the sky painted? Are there really brush strokes that show up under magnification? Yes, said Mercer. I can't see them. You're too close, Mercer said. You have to be a long way off the way the androids are. They have a better perspective. Is that why they claim you're a fraud? I am a fraud, Mercer said. They're sincere. Their research is genuine. From their standpoint, I am an elderly retired bit player named Al Jerry. All of it, their disclosure is true. They interviewed me at my home, as they claim. I told them whatever they wanted to know, which was everything, including about the whiskey. Mercer smiled. It was true. They did a good job. And from their standpoint, Buster Friendly's disclosure was convincing. They will have trouble understanding why nothing has changed because you're still here and I'm still here. Mercer indicated with a sweep of the hand, the barren rising hillside, the familiar place. I lifted you from the tomb world below just now, and I will continue to lift you until you lose interest and want to quit. But you will have to stop searching for me because I will never stop searching for you. Then there's a funny little aside. I didn't like that about the whiskey, Isidore said. That's lowering. Mercer responds, that's because you're a highly moral person. I'm not. I don't judge. Not even myself. Before I forget it, there's something of yours here. He opens his fingers. On his hand rested the mutilated spider, but with its snipped off legs restored. And so what is uh, Isidore discovering? That yes, it can all be fake, and yet Mercer is still there with them, and the empathy experience is still possible. And miracles of a sort can still happen. What about Deckard? Mercer does something very different with Deckard. He's already talked to him before and said, you know, it's the nature of life that you have to violate your identity um, and there are some things that you need to do. Mercer is, is going to face the three remaining androids. A figure in the shadows waited. If you move, I'll retire you, Rick said, the male one waiting for him. I'm not an android, the figure said. My name is Mercer. And so... Um, Rick says, am I outside Mercerism now? Because Isidore had told him that he was. And Mercer tells him, no, Mr. Isidore spoke for himself, not for me. What you're doing has to be done. I said that already. And then he imparts information to Deckard that is going to essentially save his life. 
and allow him to kill the killers, to fulfill his uh, you know, mission of, of destroying these androids. And he tells her, um, he tells him, One of them is behind you and below, not in the apartment. It will be the hard one of the three, and you must retire it first. Quick, Mr. Deckard, on the steps. And this is where Pris attacks, Pris who looks like Rachel Rosen. And Deckard does that, and then he goes on to kill the other two androids, the two babies. After all of this happens, Rick uh, drives on his own to a place where nobody else is, right? Uh, A cluttered hillside swooped up at him. He lifted the hover car as the world came close. Uh, He talks to, you know, tries to talk to Dave Holden and, um, you know, discusses uh, what's going on. And then, here we go. The, he hung up. The air had a foul quality. He rolled up the window again. Dave is really out, he reflected. I wonder why they didn't get me. Uh, the car had become too cold now, so he opened the door and stepped out. A noxious, unexpected wind filtered through his clothes, and he began to walk. Um, and he walks up on the hillside, in which each step the weight on him grew. Too tired, he thought, to climb. Stopping, he wiped stinging sweat from his eyes, salt tears produced by his skin, his whole aching body. Then angry at himself, he spat, spat with wrath and contempt for himself, with utter hate on the barren ground. Then he resumed his trudge up the slope, the lonely and unfamiliar terrain, remote from everything. Nothing lived here except himself. And he's thinking to himself, and then... At that moment, the first rock, and it was not rubber or soft foam plastic, struck him. And the pain, the first knowledge of absolute isolation and suffering, touched him throughout in its undisguised actual form. He halted, then goaded on, the goad invisible but real. He resumed his climb, rolling upward like the stones. I'm doing what stones do without volition. Mercer, he said, panting. In front of him distinguished a shadowy figure. Wilbur Mercer, is that you? My God, he realized, it's my shadow. I have to get out of here, down off this hill. Why? Because in the Mercer story, he goes up the hill, gets hit with a lot of rocks, gets up to the top, and then the killers kill him, right? So Rick is saying, oh, I don't want that. Now, what, what has happened here? What's going on? He has identified now with Mercer. And as uh, when he's talking to Miss Marston, uh, she says, Mr. Deckard, you look awful, so tired, and your cheek is bleeding. You look like Wilbur Mercer. And he says, I am. I'm Will- Wilbur Mercer. I've permanently fused with him, and I can't unfuse. I'm sitting here waiting to unfuse somewhere near the Oregon border, you know. And he says a little bit later, It's strange, I had the absolute, utter, complete, real illusion I'd become Mercer and people were lobbing rocks at me, but not the way you experience it when you hold the handles of an empathy box. When you use an empathy box, you feel you're with Mercer. The difference is, I wasn't with anyone, I was alone. So this is something a bit different at this point, but he's able to get out of it. And then we get to the very end of this discussion with something that Rick Deckert says. She says to him, they're saying now that Mercer is a fake. His response, Mercer isn't a fake unless reality is a fake. So there's a sort of bedrock that we hit here with what's left of Mercer. After all the other stuff has been revealed or peeled away, there's still something going on that is at the very center of at least Rick Deckert's experience now, and which potentially is so for others. And we see that the revelation of Mercerism as a swindle, as Mercer himself uh, and, you know, says to Isidore, has changed nothing. 